So not every relationship is unicorns and rainbows. What do you do if you have to work with someone you don't get along with? Hello, my name is Chester Elton, and I'm here with my dear friend and co-author, Adrian Gosta. Uh, you weren't talking about me, right, Chess? You know? <laughs> no, <laughs> hey, you know, we've all had the experience of working with someone, and they just didn't get us. In fact, maybe they drive us a little nuts. Today, we're going to discuss how you get along with almost anyone, and why? To reduce your anxiety levels. As always, we hope the time you spend with us will help reduce the stigma of anxiety at work and in your personal life. And with us today is our dear friend, Michael Bungay Stanier. He is the founder of Box of Crayons, which helps organizations transform from advice-driven to curiosity-led. He is the author of the best-selling book, The Coaching Habit, a must-have if you want to be an executive coach, by the way. His new book is How to Work with Almost Anyone. Michael is a Rhodes Scholar and has been named the number one thought leader in coaching. Before founding Box of Crayons, Michael held senior positions in the corporate, consultancy, and agency worlds. Michael is has a master's degree from Oxford and a law degree from the Australian National University. Welcome to the show, MBS. We are delighted to have you back. You know, you guys, uh, you guys t- of, of clearly have like the memories of a goldfish because I think this is my third or maybe fourth <laughs> appearance on your show. <laughs> And you, keep, you, you need to write down somewhere, stop inviting Michael. It only ends in tears. But I, look, I appreciate it. Thank you. You know, by the way, before we get started, I love that you brought up goldfish because in your book, I learned the collective noun for goldfish is a glint. Mm, Isn't that good? That's, very nice. that's a I mean, really good one. Yeah. I've, got a, I've got a book behind me in my, on my shelves, which is like all, all of the kind of collective nouns for all of the oh. animals. And people just have so much fun coming up with these ideas for how do you summarize a a group of things. And I think a glint of a goldfish is pretty wonderful. It is. Well, wonderful. and we're excited to talk to you about the new book here. Uh, Michael is really one of the smartest people we know. So we're going to learn a lot today. <laughs> so people, what? You, you, you need, we don't to, know you many need people. to expand no, the circle no, no, of no, your we friends. Do. We know I mean, a lot of people. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> Now walk us through the idea of, of how to work with almost anyone. You're, you're right sure. that we need to communicate about who we are and what brings out the best and worst of us That's at right. work. And you say we should bring a, a tool box to to this conversation so walk us through that yeah there's a bigger idea behind that and it is simply this our working relationships have such a big determination on our happiness and our success and most of the time we cross our fingers and we hope for the best and sometimes it goes really well and sometimes it's terrible right from the start and most of the time it's somewhere in the middle but what always happens is somewhere down the line things go off the rails a little bit something gets dented something gets cracked something gets blown up and the relationship can get a bit damaged and rather than crossing our fingers and hoping for the best i think we should strive for the best possible relationship with the people we're working with not every relationship is going to be perfect but what's the best possible relationship between you and that one other person And I think one of the secrets to that, and this is what I really teach in this new book, is have a conversation about how you work together before you plunge into the what will we work on. Because the what always is screaming loudly. It's exciting, it's buzzy, it's glittery, it's urgent. But if you stop for a moment, take a beat and go, hey, Chester, hey, Adrian, you and I are going to do a podcast together. Before we get into it, let's talk about what makes for a good podcast. Here's, here's what I, where I shine as a guest. Here's where you really thrive as hosts. How do we make that happen between us? Because if we build a relationship that is safe and vital and repairable, we have a better chance of doing the work in a way that gets more done and lights us up as well. You know, it's so interesting. We didn't do that. We probably should have done that. <laughs> we no, because we're friends. We're, we're catching up on gossip. We're like, well, I see you in Nashville. Are you going to London? So we should have done that. So we'll just, we'll just pause the podcast here and have a proper conversation and get our act together. <laughs> there you go. You know, it's interesting. You talk about these five questions, you know, mm. the, what you call the keystone conversation. So can you preview some of those questions for us and for yeah. our listeners? Well, let's talk about why I, I called it a keystone conversation. The first reason and the most important reason is I just love giving things labels. I love giving things a handle that people can use and remember. So part of it's just my indulging my sense of creation. 
But, you know, a keystone, most people will know what a keystone is. It's in architecture, it's the big stone at the top of an arch, you know, the two sides of the arch come together, and it's the keystone that gives it strength and stability and the ability to bear stress. And as soon as you think about that in terms of relationship, strength, stability, the ability to bear stress, you're like, great, that would be pretty, you know, that's a, that's a good metaphor, that works. But in doing the research for the book, I discovered that um, they've taken the idea of a keystone stone and moved it into the world of ecology and biology as well. So there's a thing called a keystone species. And the best story around this is the wolves being reintroduced into Yellowstone National Park in the 80s. That park was kind of being run down and denuded, in part because there were so many elk wandering, wandering the park. When they brought the wolves back in, the wolves ate the elk, the elk stopped eating the trees, the trees started to grow, more birds, the river changed course, more fish, more beavers, beavers made the river change course again, and the whole environment started to flourish and become more resilient because it had found balance through this uh, keystone um, uh, sp species, the wolf. And so whether your metaphor is, is buildings or kind of gardens, there is a way for you to be thinking a keystone conversation starts building an environment that is richer, more resilient, more able to bear stress, more able to flourish. And that's why I went with that metaphor. And as you said, there are five good questions, I think, that can set up a conversation. So give us one or two of those questions. Yeah. You know, if you're listening and you're like, oh, I'm not sure I've got a pen and paper to remember all these questions, the, 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 the takeaway is just have a conversation about how we work together rather than what we're working on. And it can just sound like, hey, you and I are about to start working together. Let's talk about it. When do you work best? Let me tell you when I work best. But the five questions are a, a deeper dive around that. And actually, the first question is the amplify question. And it is, what's your best? What's your best? It's a slightly awkward question. I think probably if I had another pass at it, I might try and find a slightly different wording for it. But where it comes from, Adrian and Chester, is I didn't want to say, what are you good at? Because that's a really limiting question. I didn't want to say, what are your strengths? Because that's a little bit abstract. I wanted to capture the moment when you shine and when you flow. You know, that sense of flow state, that's an internal state where, you know, you're in the zone, time speeds up and slows down, you're, like, you're in your creative genius mode, you're like, this is, this is it, this is what I love to do. And shining is what other people see in you, you're, you're kind of committed, you're leaning in, your eyes are kind of glistening and lit up, and it's like, how do you get that to happen? And what a powerful first exchange of information, where I'm like, let me tell you when I shine and when I flow, you tell me when you shine and when you flow, all right, <laughs> how are we going to get more of that <laughs> in the way that we work together? Because it's easy to make up what you think the, will, will bring out the other person's best or what their best is. Now you're saying, this is me. This is what I look like when I'm, when I'm in that space. Let me tell you. If you can help me get there, brilliant. Yeah, you know what? The thing I love about that question is it does go to the more the emotional part of the relationship, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Adrian and I always make fun of the, the, what are your greatest strengths? You know, we used to get that question when we were interviewing, you know, the, the mock interview. And you say, oh, my, yeah. I'm just too hard on myself. I'm just a perfectionist. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I just, I never give up. You know, like, yeah, exactly. where do you shine? Where do you flow? Really gets to what brings you joy in, in, in the workplace. What a, well, what let me turn the table on the two of you, because you have a long-lasting and successful working relationship. So people listening are going to be looking at the two of you going, you've got some magic happening. How do you do it? You know, if you were both answering that question, um, what, what are some of the things that you'd say? I mean, Chester, where would you start? Well, I, I think the key is we live about 3,000 miles apart. <laughs> 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 and we, we say that jokingly. I think it actually is good. We, you know, we, we're not on top of each other every day. Right. We have yeah. very different personalities and very different lifestyles. And, and I think the, the, what's been the key to our success is we give each other a lot of space. Right. And, and we have great respect for, for each other's talents. I mean, you know, um, people, uh, I go to my high school reunion and they say, you're a New York Times bestselling author? And I go, well, 
my co-author is actually the author. You know, he's the brain. And, and then they go, oh, well, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> and now it all comes in. So we're very complimentary. I, I, and I'm interested in what Adrian, what you would say. I, I think that we give each other good space. Yeah. yeah. I think, you know, the, the key is, is pa- you know, patience, perseverance, <laughs> unflappability, stamina, <laughs> fortitude, persistence, tolerance. <laughs> okay, I'm reading from the thesaurus here. But uh, yeah, no, yeah. No. <laughs> no, 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 I'm just your, your ability, Your ability to tolerate pain is extraordinary, Adrian. <laughs> no. It's very impressive. You know, one of the things that, that there seriously is with, with our relationship is, is a lack of ego. Um, yeah. And this is kind of, I'm going to ask you a question in a minute here. I wanted to ask you a question about a social contract that you talk about. But I think yeah. Chester and I, we have a social contract in our in our working relationship that says, look, there's no ego here. You know, if he gets an engagement, I don't go, oh, I should have. No, if if I do something, he does. We we both appreciate each other's skills. Um, yeah. He ha- he brings skills that I don't have. He I bring skills that he doesn't have. Or you know, we have yeah. you know, yeah. and so and we learn from each other and absolutely no ego that very little that goes into this because i don't think any humans have no ego but <laughs> but as we work with each other that yeah. that's our social contract so the so question three and question four mm. of the five yeah. are the bad date and the good date questions and i think what you're talking about taps into what might spring forth as answers to those questions so the good date question is what can we learn from successful past relationships And the flip side is the bad date question, which is like, what can we learn from frustrating past relationships? Because patterns in your past relationships will repeat in your future relationships. That's a promise. And um, I mean, I know past relationships, different person, different context, you know, different time. But those patterns are deep. They will keep showing up. So when you have a conversation, when you're setting up the way the two of you work and you go, you know, what can you learn from a really successful past collaboration? And you could go, it's like lack of ego. It's a willingness to collaborate. It's a willingness to give each other the space that we need to to do our work. It's about knowing how to, who knows what else you'd say. You actually get to kind of say, let me tell you, rather than guessing, rather than hoping we're just going to figure it out, let me tell you what I've learned (laughs) about what a good relationship is and what I do and what I don't do and what I say and what I don't say, and what that other person does and doesn't do and says and doesn't say. And then the flip side is really useful as well. I mean, often with our past frustrating failed relationships, and we all have those, mostly we try and put them you know, in a black box and push it under the bed and lock it into a cupboard like, let's not talk about that again because that was miserable. But it's like if you're, if you're brave enough, pull it out into the light and go, what do I learn from that? Because you'll point the finger at that other person because, you know, they probably were really hard to work with. But it's really interesting to ask yourself those dysfunctional working relationships. What did I do and what did I not do? Particularly, what did I not do? What did I say and what did I not say? Particularly, what did I not say? Mm. And understanding that from the person you're building the best possible relationship with just gives you a chance to keep coming back to the health of the working relationship to say, we're committed to this. It's not just about the work. It's about how you and I are working together. How are we doing? Excellent. So there's three of the five. Do you want to fill in the other two or do you want sure. to leave some reason well, for people, people to buy want to buy the book? Copies. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I can't give them all the way. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've given you the three easy ones. So question number two is amazing. And question number five will blow your mind. <laughs> It'll change your life. Yeah. yeah. I'm, going to, I'm going to tell you what the, the fifth question is uh, because when I talk about the best possible relationship, I say, look, they, they have some combination of being safe and being vital and being repairable. And these three uh, elements kind of dance with each other, in tension with each other, particularly the first two. You want a relationship to be safe. And our mutual friend, Amy Edmondson, you know, she's the OG in psychological safety. She's really helped all of us understand the, the importance of that and the power of that. And that's backed up by the research Google did with Project Aristotle and Project Oxygen around good teams and good managers and the like. You've got to create that safety so people can show up as who they are and say what they want to say without fear of punishment or kind of diminishment around that. But it can't just be about safety. It's also about how do we bring out our best? How do we step to the edge? How do we bring life to this conversation? How do we have adventures together? And 
there's always a dance between safety and vitality. You know, you can imagine relationships that are so safe that they are a bit smothering and they kind of lose that, that edge. You can imagine relationships that are right on the edge, but if something goes wrong, it really breaks and it breaks badly. And that's why the third characteristic is so important, the repairability, which is like, how will we fix it when things go wrong? And that is the fifth question, which is how will we fix it when things go wrong? And what that question unlocks is not just, okay, how do I fix things when things are wrong? What's my role in that? But it is an acknowledgement that this relationship will go wrong. What are we going to do about that when it, when it happens? Mm -hmm. And so... What normally happens is people go, oh, God, it's gone wrong. I don't know what to do. I don't want to say. Oh, maybe this is what always happens. It just kind of deteriorates. Now there's this opportunity to step back in and go, hey, let me tell you how that didn't work for me. Or, hey, let me check in with you because I'm not sure how you're doing. Or, hey, let me say sorry because I think I stepped on your toes in some way here. It's an ability to actively engage in the repair of the relationship counterintuitively often makes that relationship even stronger because you've gone through that tearing and then repairing. You know, it is so interesting as you talk about that, the ability to say, I'm sorry, mm. and to forgive each other. Uh, that really is hard in a lot of relationships if you don't feel safe. That's so right. I, I love that you've put those three together. You know, it has to be safe and vital. And it has to be repairable. Okay, so I want to highlight, you know, you have, a, you have wonderful covers of your books. I always enjoy nice. your, and, and the interaction inside your books is, is beyond delightful. The, the key word on the cover of your book is the almost part. Yeah. So you can say we can get, get along with almost everyone. So what yeah. about people you just, you just can't get along with? So what's the plan there? Well, um, the first thing to say is by saying how to work with almost anyone, what I'm really saying is you can work with almost anyone. Um, and and that's, a, that's a big group of people. And we often tend to write off more people than we, we, we should because we're like, actually, even if the relationship's not that great, you can still build the best possible relationship. You can make a bad relationship good enough and figure out a way through that. But there are people with whom it just feels impossible. And... You know, for any number of reasons, but one of the um, reasons might be they're a bit, psych a bit of a psychopath, and I'm using that in the you know the actual technical mental health definition of a psychopath because about one percent of the population have these characteristics of a psychopath. You know, lack of empathy, um, uh, lack of like caring, this kind of ambition, take no prisoners sort of way of working, often combined with charisma <laughs> and charm which explains why they say that there's a, a, a higher proportion of psychopaths in the senior levels of organizations than you'd expect in the general population so one percent in the popul general population is the is the standard measurement i've seen three percent and i've seen 16 percent and i've seen 20 percent of ceos have psychopathic qualities so who knows what that research is? It feels like 20% is a lot. <laughs> I yeah. mean, that's one in five. It doesn't quite land for me. But even if it's 3%, you know, it's like, it just means that, sadly, I think, the qualities of a psychopath often help you really flourish in an organization. They help you climb because you're, you're ruthless. You're like, you have no empathy. You're just about getting results done at, at any cost. And so there's a way to go, look, I need to protect myself around this because having a keystone conversation is an act of, is an exchange and it's an act of vulnerability and an act of courage to initiate that. I just don't want to have people write off too many relationships too quickly as unworkable. Um, but I also want people to stay safe and realize that it's, it's, it's not possible. Plus, I just, I just don't think I could write a book called how to work with anyone I'm like <laughs> mm, i just feel like i'm i'm you know probably over promising here yeah too big a promise too, yeah, a too big too, yeah, yeah. exactly and unfortunately nowadays people go oh there's my out because i don't like this right. person because they don't have my politics or they don't have i don't root well, for right. my sports team whatever it is and unfortunately too many people are taking that out nowadays right. yeah you know at the heart of this work and this is 
kind of the thread that combines things like the coaching habit and the advice trap and even how to begin, which you guys were kind enough to interview me on as well. There's this kind of commitment to how do you keep showing up as a human? And in our organizational life, there are constant pressures to be dehumanized <laughs> and, and, and to dehumanize others. You know, Martin Buber, the philosopher, will say two types of relationships, I-it relationships and I-thou relationships. And I-it relationships are when you kind of other the other person, when you see less of their humanity, where you put them into a box, give, make them a, a cliche. Mm. Um, I-thou is that when you're kind of present to your own humanity and therefore present to the other person's humanity. And it's all... You know, it's all kind of high-level stuff. <laughs> but I'm like, I'd love more human-to-human, adult-to-adult relationships with whom we work. And this ability, um, and, you know, it's, you can say it's politically driven and you can see it happening on the left and the right equally, I think, which is like how quickly and easy it is to other the other side and demonize them, turn them into the enemy, turn them into us versus them, this... this narrowing and tribalization that we see and can feel in, pl in places um i'm hoping some of the tools here might help people have the courage to say what if you and i try and figure out the best possible relationship the best way we have to work together that's beautiful you know it is that being more human mm. uh you know to me i i interpret that as uh, being more kind Let's just be more kind and considerate to each right. other. Yeah. I think that's so nice. And, you know, I think this podcast is one of those gifts to this commitment to humanity because speaking about anxiety at work and acknowledging that is acknowledging the complexity and the messiness and the frailty and the strength and the goodness and the possibilities about all of us in the work that we do. And in acknowledging kind of the, the kind of the the things that make our heart beat, not just the things that our hands do. We actually have this kind of chance to kind of connect in with our own humanity. So you know, this podcast is a great gift to us all for that. Oh, thank you. You know, we, we work with, probably like you do too, a lot of technical organizations, banks and mm. engineering firms and manufacturing. And, and, and in many cases, as you know, they're not very comfortable sort of crossing personal boundaries. You leave your personal life at the yeah. door. We're seeing a lot of younger people coming in who want to share. Um, yeah. So what do you say when, you know, when you have some resistance of people who say, I don't want you in my head, Michael. I don't want you, you yeah. know, I understand where you're coming from, but my personal life and my, the way I think, that's mine. Yeah. Well, I'd probably come back to saying this. Look, every choice you make has prizes and punishments. So you can choose not to have a conversation like this. And the prizes are you protect your, your sense of self and your privacy and you don't give away anything. You get to put on your game face and your game mask and all of that and show up. The, the cost of that is your relationship will unfold without you actively contributing to it and when you think about the impact on you on your best working relationships how it brought out your best helped you be more courageous help you do better work helped you kind of expand your sense of self and the impact you have and you when you think about the worst relationships the most frustrating ones and how you felt compartmentalized, diminished, you lost your courage, you lost some of your confidence, you lost your sense of autonomy, you became more kind of victim-y, to use that kind of therapy word. You're like, it really makes a difference, the quality of your working relationship. So the willingness to ask and answer some of these questions, and you get to share, control what you share. You don't have to talk about the traumatic childhood incident that still makes you cry. You get to just talk about, let me tell you about me at my best when I'm in a good working relationship. Let me tell you what that looks like. What you're doing is you're saying, look, I, don't, I want this working relationship to not suck. <laughs> I want it to be as good as it can be. Let me exchange some information with you and you do the same for me to give us both a better chance of co-owning the potential success of how we work together. You know, such great advice, not just for working relationships, just relationships in general, right? Yeah, for yeah. Sure. 
Well, listen, our, our guest is the our, our dear friend, Michael Bungay Stanier. He is the best-selling author of The Coaching Habit, which you should have on your desk, The Advice Trap, How to Begin, and now How to Get Along with Almost Anyone. Uh, Michael, where can people, other than your wonderful books that are available <laughs> everywhere, yeah. where can people find out more about your work and Box of Crayons? Yeah, look, the, the, the big place for my work, particularly for supporting individuals to unlock their greatness and other people's greatness is mbs.works. And that's where you find kind of stuff about the books as well. If you're interested in this book in particular, bestpossiblerelationship.com. And if you've got a large training budget and a corporation and you're like, we need to bring in coach training for our people, mm -hmm. Box of Crayons is the best place for that. After you've spent all your budget with Chester and Adrian, obviously, <laughs> and they've got nothing less to sell you, and you're like, I've still got all this money left over, then, then come to Box of Crayons and we can talk. Uh, excellent, excellent. So we're always interested in self-care tactics. Yeah. You know, what are you doing to keep your relationships healthy and vibrant? How do you reduce your stress and anxiety? Can you give us a couple things that, that you do that keep you in this wonderful learning and curious state of mind? Well, I... I journal, um, and I'm not a big you know, writer of notes. It took me a long time to find the journal pattern that worked for me. But um, one of the things that I do is pretty much every workday morning, I check in with three questions. I go, um, what am I noticing? And that makes me notice what, how I'm feeling and what I'm thinking and what's going on in front of me. So it kind of asks me to be present to the moment. I say, what am I grateful for? because, and I know you have a, a gratitude journal that's in the works as well, and so I don't need to tell anybody the power of gratitude because it is, if there's a silver bullet, it's about expressing gratitude on a regular basis, so we all know that. And then the third thing to check in is, what's the one thing today? Like if I can only get one thing done, what's the most important thing that I should be thinking about and working on? Hmm. And that just helps me uh, kind of arrive at my morning and kind of go, okay, how am I doing with that? And then the thing I do in the evening that I don't do every evening, I wish I did, was go for a walk with my wife. Because I, I know, I, know I, I sound like I know what I'm doing, but I'm not that good a communicator <laughs> with my wife. She's like, tell me more stuff. And I'm like, I can't even remember. I can't remember. <laughs> and when I go for a walk, I start remembering things to tell her. Right. And just also being in movement and being out of the house yeah. really helps. It does. Yeah, men, they say, we communicate better side to side, women right. face to face. And so, yeah, I think that's right. it does help. I think that's why, yeah. that's why bars work. <laughs> uh, we're sitting in a bar and you're like, I don't have to look at you. We can just yeah. talk out into the air or why, why men talk when they're in cars because they're like, yeah. we're driving and yeah. you're in the passenger seat and I don't have to look at you around that. So I think <laughs> there's some truth to too that. too uncomfortable, yeah. Okay, <laughs> this has been just, as always, so wonderful to learn from the MBS. Okay, so we bump into you at uh, at in our Nashville uh, retreat that's coming up here for Marshall Goldsmith and that's and right. we have 30 seconds of your time before you've got to run because everybody wants you tell me one thing that you found with this book that surprised you as you did this research one thing that you, you think we need to all us and our listeners need to know I think it's the power of reaching out I heard this from somebody talking about kind of deathbed regrets, actually, and how one of the regrets that she heard is, I wish I'd reached out to, you know, relationships that had faded, um, hurts that had happened that could have been healed. And uh, what I wish for people is when you're thinking about the people with whom you work, be the person who reaches out to start building the best possible relationship because... You know, as somebody once said, nobody likes to say hello, but everybody loves to be greeted. So if you're the person who says hello, that is a great gift. That is so simple and so lovely, um, Michael. As always, you've challenged our thinking. You've educated us. You've made us laugh. Um, time with you is always time well spent. And <laughs> Thank you. If, you, if you can't get him live on your podcast, um, let's see, buy his books. Hey, yeah, see what I did there? And buy that. his latest book, How to Get Along with Almost anyone. I promise you it's an engaging read. It will be a delight. Thanks again, uh, Michael, for being on our show. It's always so much fun to be with Thanks you. Thanks both. It's such a delight. Well, Chess, just another fascinating podcast. I'm so glad to have Michael 
Bungay Stan, you're back. Um, you know, million selling plus book of, uh, you know, his coaching books. And, uh, you know, boy, is there a better guy to be preaching to than you who has friendship as your number one motivator? <laughs> uh, you know, you spend a lot of time thinking about your work relationships and, and re- reaching out to people. And so this had to resonate. Uh, yeah, really very much with me. You know, I, I, I so appreciate Michael's ability to ask the right question. You know, we say, oh, I'll ask more questions. Be curious. He asks the right questions, and he's very thoughtful. I mean, all his books are centered around, are you asking the right questions? And giving voice to the other person. Mm-hmm. You know, I love, uh, right at the beginning, he said, let's talk about how we will work together before we talk about the what. Yeah. Such a simple thing to do, because we want to jump to the what. We got to get this done. So let's go ahead and start doing it as opposed to saying, hey, so how would be the best way for us to work together to get the best possible results? What were some of your takeaways? Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of, you know, again, the coaching habit was great questions. Um, This book obviously has some great questions. I love the bad date and good date questions. You know, the idea is what can we learn from good and bad, successful relationships. How many bosses, when they're interviewing an employee, says, okay, Chester, uh, we want you to join our team. Tell me about some good relationships you've had with bosses and maybe some some that didn't work out as well. What can I learn as your boss to be? What a great question that you would ask or, or a colleague, et cetera. Um, and did we ever do that, you know, sort of dating? Probably not. Where, this <laughs> no, is what I've sure learned, sure. works and doesn't. No, we, we try to present ourselves as perfect, and none of us are. And so, like he says, there's no black box. Pull everything into the light. Yeah, and, and the idea of not just the good date, which is easy to talk about. Uh, what was the bad date? The other thing he said that really resonated with me was, tell me where you get to where you really shine and where you're in the flow. You know, what brings up the very best in you? I, I, I thought that was really a, a wonderful way to look at a relationship. And then my other takeaway was question five is to create a relationship that's safe, vital, and repairable. You know, the, the first two you kind of are exciting. How do, we, how do we fix it when we go off the Rails, and and that's hard because you, you know, you're trying to anticipate. And, and I think that's why, you know, you're creating the social contract beforehand because you're going through a lot of these things. So you're trying to avoid um, making, you know, having these problems, but things will. Inevitably, you'll have an issue. So how do you repair? Who says, I'm sorry first, because some people are very proud. They won't. And that's just the way they're wired. Um, so, yeah, that's a tough one. But I think even just beginning that conversation can really help. And, you know, last thing that I took away, too, was this idea of, of relationships. Are they I-it conversations or I-thou, where we humanize those people who maybe we don't really agree with or get along with? Um, you know, I mean, maybe we're really social creatures and people who want to go home at five. Well, why aren't you coming to the bar with us? It's OK. They're not bad people. They just think differently than we do. Right, right. Uh, My last takeaway was his one big point is uh, reach out. You know, be the one that reaches out. Uh, So many people on their deathbeds, he said, had that regret that they didn't reach out more, that they didn't give a call to that cousin or or someone they hadn't talked to in a while or a friend that they weren't sure whether they were suffering or not, just they hadn't reached out in the last little while. And I I found that uh, over the last year, for me has been really important. Just somebody's my somebody's name comes into your head, just give them a call. I, I love going old school and actually calling them on the phone. Which is different because I want to give a, because because you, you may, because you're a kind person, may not get to this, but now and then somebody will reach out to you. They'll send you a text. Hey, Chess, has it been a while thinking about you? And you'll respond back with very open, vulnerable. Hey, it's been a little hard time for us, but thanks so much for reaching out. And then, whew, <laughs> there's no response there's nothing you know yeah, yeah, and that yeah. that's not a good reach out is it not at all not at all hey let's get on the phone hey let's find some time to catch up and i think we get caught up in this whole idea that it's got to be a video call now because we got you know so used to 
Zoom and Teams and all that during the pandemic. Listen, a phone a phone conversation works great. Even a text that says, "Hey, I was just thinking about you today. How are things going? Do you want to get together for a quick call?" It it means the world to people, and you never know. Yeah. You never know when somebody just needs a little positive little voice in their ear that says, hey, you're remembered, you're not forgotten. Because what's the ultimate message there? I care about you, I love you, you're important. Yeah. I, exactly. I, I love uh, Michael's questions, or, or MBS, as he's, his brand is, is known as. He, he teaches us to ask the right questions, and then, really importantly, be sure to listen. Love it, love it. Well, thank you to MBS for joining us today. For all of you who listened in, uh, big thanks to our producer, Brent Klein, to Christy Lawrence, who helps us find amazing guests like MBS. Uh, If you like the podcast, please download it, share it. Um, We also would love you to visit thecultureworks.com. You get some free resources, including the first chapter free to our new book, Anxiety at Work, which must be worth, I don't know, Tens of tens of cents, right, Chess? Oh yeah, uh, ten large, as we say, uh, ten ten pennies. And uh, we love speaking to audiences as well. You know, whether um, globally, virtually, in person, small leadership groups, big uh, rock as audiences, we love being on stage and sharing what we've learned over the last two decades about how to build great cultures, great teams, enhance your leadership, and obviously how to deal with mental health and anxiety in the workplace. So give us a call. We'd love to speak at your event. Well, Adrian, as almost always, borrowing the word from Michael's book, uh, I'll give you the last word. Well, thanks everybody again for joining us today. And until next time, we wish you the best of mental health. 